in the night report for Thursday, May 8th. Stay tuned for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Everything has become more, I suppose we could say, vulgar these days, especially warfare. Today we fight with such complex scientific weaponry, whereas not too long ago, arms had a personality of their very own. They were beautifully made, skillfully decorated, and were designed to be used by gentlemen. But it's all part of the price we pay for progress. Doc, I refuse to believe that Alexandra killed him. But she admits she did it, sir. I don't care what she says or what anybody else says. People cannot act against their basic nature. Oh, is that a fact? For Alexandra, even to reach for a gun is completely alien to the way she's made. Huh. You're a great believer in basic nature, sir. Absolutely. Tell me, and, and uh, don't answer too fast. How do you really know what your basic nature is? mystery drama, The 44, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars John Beale. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Much has been written concerning the flowering of New England. By this, of course, is meant the intellectual, spiritual, and literary heritage of that section of our country, which is justly hailed as the cradle of our culture. But New England was also the birthplace of our factories and forges. Indeed, at one time, she was the gunsmith to our nation. Back in 1851, in his Hartford armory, a gunsmith named Samuel Colt started to manufacture a very popular revolver. It came in caliber 36 for the Navy and caliber 44 for the Army. And one of these has survived to become the centerpiece of our story. Sheriff Scobie speaking. Uh, Sheriff? Yes? Uh, this is Alexandra Edison. Oh. Yes, Alexandra? I, uh, I, I dislike to disturb you at home, especially on the Sabbath. I did call your office, but there was no answer. I don't mind, Alexandra. Now, how can I help you? Help me? I, I'm afraid no one can help me now. What are you saying? Yes, because, you see, I broke the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Alexandra. I have killed. I have taken a life, a human life. Is this you? Alexandra Edison. I have shot and killed Mr. Martin K. Beasley. Uh, Alexandra, don't do anything. Don't touch anything. I'll be right there. He's dead. Yes. Yes, I told you. Well, officially, I suppose the coroner has to make that determination, but this man is obviously deceased. And you shot him, you say? I'm sorry, Sheriff. You, Alexandra? You killed him? A woman like you? Why, well, never in a million years. I, I mean... How little we really know about ourselves. What a mysterious and terrible creature is man. What did you kill him with? Well, I, I dropped the gun on the floor. The gun? That gun? Mm-hmm. Well, that's, a, that's an old... That's an antique. A Civil War pistol. I wouldn't think it could even fire. I killed him with that pistol. Yeah. Well, I'll have to call the coroner. Now, this man... This dead fellow, this... Martin K. Beasley... The name's familiar. 
He's... Is he the one who's been trying to get you to sell the estate? Yes. Yes, he, he was a cousin of mine. And you shot him? Well, I... I'm really very much embarrassed by what I have to do. I have to place you under arrest. I understand. But... I just can't see myself taking you off to jail. Now, this isn't the regular way to do it, but... Uh, if you give me your promise not to... Uh, I was about to say you're not to try to escape. Well, I suppose that's just what it amounts to, Sherry. Well, just promise me not to leave the estate. Well, where would I go? Even so, for the record. Well, if, if the promise is important, it is freely given. Now, why did you shoot him? Why? Oh... Now, look, I know this isn't very easy for you, and I'm sure you're, you're very upset... It's obvious why you shot him. Self-defense. So, there won't be a problem. Oh, but I... And the coroner's jury will dismiss the whole thing. But, but Sheriff, Now, I... Alexandra, you're not to worry. And believe me, everything's going to be all right. Sheriff Scobie? Yes, sir? My name is Hawkins, Everett Hawkins. Glad to meet you, Mr. Hawkins. But I don't think you will be when I tell you who I am and why I'm here. Proceed, Mr. Hawkins. To begin with, I'm a member of the law firm of Hawkins and Beasley. The late Martin K. Beasley was my partner. Yes, sir. I've come here to see that justice is done. Well, sir, nobody should object to justice. The thing is crystal clear. That mad woman shot him. I beg your pardon, sir? Come, Sheriff, it's a matter of record. That Miss Alexandra Edison is not sane. And where is this particular record kept? Oh, I see. I see what's going on here. A little conspiracy. All the hometown folks closing ranks around poor Alexandra Edison to protect her from the rapacious city slickers. Can you document that charge, Mr. Hawkins? The woman has confessed to murder. Why isn't she in custody? Why put her in jail? She's not going anywhere. Why subject her to needless embarrassment? That woman belongs in jail, and I demand that she be placed there at once. You demand? Believe me, no one wants to do Miss Edison any harm. Poor woman, poor, frustrated, unbalanced woman. Why hold her responsible for an act over which she had no control? Where are you headed, Mr. Hawkins? I shall suggest to the prosecutor that the state accept a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. They'll put her in a sanitarium. She'll receive the best psychiatric care. And naturally, if she's declared incompetent, she won't be able to manage her affairs, huh? Naturally. She only had one relation, Mr. Beasley. Now that he's dead, uh, his wife, Mrs. Beasley, is the heiress. And she should be appointed executrix of the estate. Poor Mrs. Beasley, she's in a state of shock. I'm sure she'll recover. You're a very cynical person, Sheriff. She's here in town. She came down last week with her husband to see if she could help him talk sense to poor Alexandra Edison. I'm sorry, Alexandra. I didn't want to put you in here. It's no disgrace to be in prison. I think of Thoreau and so many other good people. Alex, I want to talk to you about this Beasley fella. I understand he'd been after you to sell your land. And I refused. He threatened me. With bodily harm? Worse. He said he would have me committed to an insane asylum. And that's why you shot him? Well, I, I didn't mean to shoot him. I ordered him out of my house. He laughed at me and, oh... Oh, it, it is my fault. I lost my temper, something I never did before. I saw that old pistol lying on the mantel, and I picked it up, and I said, get out, and he laughed again, and suddenly the gun went off. Just like that? Huh? One moment, I was standing there, pointing the pistol at him, and then it suddenly became alive. And an angry thing in my hand. There was an explosion, a flash of fire, and black smoke. Then it was an accident. Oh, yes. Yes. But the fact is, 
you did pick up that pistol. Yes. Yes, I, I suppose it could be considered an irrational act. Look, don't you be the one to say that. But the very fact that one reaches for a firearm indicates a, a, a certain lack of balance. Please, Alexandra. It's going to be tough enough. Just insist that you fired in self-defense. I'm sorry to be bothering you at a time like this, Mrs. Beasley. It's all right, Sheriff. You came down here with your husband last week? Yes. I understand uh, to help him persuade Miss Edison to do something with the land, uh, the estate. Poor woman. Poor unfortunate woman. I bear her no malice whatever. I'm sure she isn't responsible. May I ask why your late husband wanted her to develop the place? You see, Martin was a member of a prestigious law firm. But we weren't rich. Of course, we would inherit the Edison estate one day. But we might have to wait all our lives. Oh, please, don't make Martin out a villain. No. And this land conservation, it was just a conceit on her part... Martin felt she could have let him have some of the property while he'd be young enough to enjoy it. What would be the harm? She claims he threatened to have her declared incompetent. Well, the fact of the matter, she is incompetent. Mrs. Beasley, I've known the woman all my life, and I wouldn't say... She's incompetent to manage her estate. You've met Miss Edison, haven't you? Yes, a week ago, when we came to town. I was with Martin, and we called on her... It was a very frustrating interview. And so when Martin went back again on Sunday, I told him he could go by himself. I wasn't having any more of Miss Edison. Oh, if I'd only known. Yes. Well, I'm sorry to have troubled you. Oh, are they going to hold the inquest? Yes. Just as soon as the ballistics laboratory verifies the murder weapon. Oh, why does it have to be verified? Everyone knows how he was murdered and with what. Why do we have this red tape? I can appreciate how you feel, Mrs. Beasley. But well, that's what the law is all about. Red tape. It's what holds our society together. Hello, Sheriff. Hi, Doc. What's up? Well, I'm tying up all my loose ends. Got my autopsy report here. Ready for the inquest tomorrow. He was shot to death, wasn't he? <laughs> what kind of a question is that? Took out the slug. Big one. 44. Well, I assume it's a 44. That's the caliber of the gun she used. And look, uh, did they send it here? They must have. They didn't send it to me. Send what? The ballistics report from the state police laboratory. No, I didn't get it. Well, it's a formality, but we need it. Check it for me, will you? Yeah. Uh, I guess she's in for it. Well, it looks that way. Unless we can prove it was self-defense or an accident. Well, that's going to be tough. Why? Well, you, you've you got this out-of-town lawyer, this Hawkins, raising a rumpus. He's got old Lester, the state's attorney, running scared, I tell you. And I'll tell you another thing. He's out to get that insanity verdict. Well, that's going to be very hard to do in this town. You really think so? Poor Alexandra. <laughs> She's kind of, well, offbeat. Well, that's not the same as being insane. Well, it depends on how you emphasize it. There are folks here who think the growth and development would be a good idea. Bring in business. Raise land values. The only way to do that is to get rid of Alexandra. Yeah. Well, I guess those people would think there's something radically wrong with me, too. Why? Because I don't think she did it. Well, she admits she did it. Well, I don't care. People cannot act against their basic nature. For Alex even to reach for a gun is absolutely alien to the way she's made. So why does she insist she did it? I don't know. When if she didn't kill him, who did? I don't know that either. Our basic nature. Can we act against it? More to the point, do we have a basic nature, or do we only think we do? How do you account for those people who lead quiet, orderly lives year in, year out, and then suddenly explode into violence and anarchy? For more than half of his working life, 
a Mr. Paul Gauguin, was a respectable, very bourgeois banker. Suddenly, he chucked it all and ran off to the South Seas to paint. What was his basic nature? I'll continue with Act Two shortly. seem to be involved with a story that deals with insanity, or let us say, alleged insanity. It is an altogether fitting theme for our series, since insanity is basically one of the great mysteries of mankind. In the first place, what is it? In the second place, who says so? Like everything else, therefore, insanity is relative, and that's where all the problems lie. You say you're convinced Alexandra Edison did not kill this Beasley fellow, Sheriff? Yes, Doc. Even though she confesses she did it? I don't care what she says. Test one, two. I, uh... Test one, two, three. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you say this because you're in love with Alex? What kind of a question is that? (laughs) Legitimate question. Why do you suggest that I'm in love with her? Well, I notice you haven't denied it. You both grew up together in this town? Together? Listen, we may have shared the air and the water, but together... You still don't deny it. She was the golden-haired little princess who lived up on the hill in the mansion with the rich folks. Me? My old man was a town drunk. Well, let's just say he was a fellow with a problem. Thank you, Doc. Well, I was going to go away, go... Get to college somehow, make something of myself, and come back as a somebody, and then. But she got sick, and I just couldn't leave. So I stayed and did the best I could. Mm-hmm. Did you ever talk to her about it? No. Well, for all you know, then, she may have been secretly in love with you all these years, too. <laughs> she never really got over that illness either. It made her kind of withdrawn, you know? But nobody can say she's crazy. Nobody. Come in. Are you Sheriff Scobie? That's me. What can I do for you? I'm Sergeant Terry of the state police. Oh? Oh, won't you sit down, Sergeant? With the crime laboratory. Working ballistics. Oh, the coroner's waiting for the report. Did you bring it here personally? Sheriff... I don't have a report. That is, not yet. You don't have a... Oh, how's that possible? What are you doing here, then? You could be in a jam, sir. What kind of jam? I don't know. I just wanted you to be aware of it unofficially. Off the record. Sheriff, you sent me the wrong gun. What? Here, take a look at it. Well, sure. It's the gun that she used. This is not the gun she used. This is not the weapon that fired the fatal shot. But this is the gun that was on the floor next to the body. That may very well be, but I can tell you, and I am prepared to testify under oath, that this gun has not been fired in, well, could be 50, 60 years. More, maybe. I I can't believe it. Look, Sheriff, look closely. See how rusty it is? And furthermore, it's a... Single action, which means you have to pull back the hammer with your thumb. I know what a single action revolver is. According to the markings, this piece was manufactured in Hartford, Connecticut in 1859. I can only tell you that this was the gun that was fired. This gun, in its present state, could not be fired. It's the gun she said she used. Well, then she isn't telling the truth. But there wasn't any other gun. Sheriff... For whatever reason, you didn't send us the murder weapon. And I'm going to have to say so publicly. I just thought you should be the first to know. Hi, Sheriff. Hello, Mother. Oh, you don't look so hot. You want the luncheon special? Yeah, I guess so. What is it today? Yankee pot roast, your favorite. Oh, why not? The condemned man ate a hearty meal. Mm, what's that supposed to mean? Oh, nothing. I just have to do a little thinking. Mm, I've been doing a little thinking myself lately. Oh, it's a shame. What is? 
Wait, you know this fellow Hawkins? Yeah. Staying here at the hotel. So is this Mrs. Beasley, widow of this fellow Alexandra Edison had to shoot. Tell me, Martha, do you think there's something doing between Hawkins and Mrs. Beasley? No, I don't think so. He's kind of lining people up against Alexandra. You know, in a, in a subtle way. He's talking about the fantastic growth and all that'll accrue to the town if the estate was taken out of Alex's hands. Sounds like a pretty crude approach to me. Oh, it is. But it sinks in. And it churns around inside people's minds. Whether they like it or not, oh, it makes me mad. Is Mrs. Beasley helping him out? Oh, she keeps to herself pretty much. Well, she's had a shock. I don't think it was too much of a shock. They didn't get along, you know, this Mr. and Mrs. Beasley. I could hear them in the room. You mean they'd fight? Oh, nothing physical, if you know what I mean. But she kept saying, I could kill you. I could kill you? Well, it might have been her way of speaking. But everything was, I could kill you. I could kill you for being stupid. I could kill you for being a coward. I could kill you for not standing up for your rights. I could kill you. That's... Interesting. Uh oh. Oh, here, here's somebody coming who's loaded for bear. Looks like. Well, uh, I, I'll order you your pot roast. Sheriff, I demand an explanation of the incredible situation which has just been brought to light by the state police. You sent them the wrong weapon. Now, why would I do that? Well, I've been listening to the town gossip. People say you're in love with her. Are you making an accusation of wrongdoing on my part? I'm making a statement, Sheriff. There seems to be a considerable amount of irregularity going on around here. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it. And I'm warning you, your hands had better be clean. Doc, I don't understand it. I don't know how we can sort this thing out. You sure that was the gun near the body? Now don't you start, Doc. It was the gun, the only gun. Well, I've got to hold an inquest. Alexandra's going to say that she killed Beasley with that pistol. A pistol that was laying on the floor. Lab is going to say that the pistol couldn't be fired. What kind of verdict can we come up with? You have to have the weapon. I know. Could she be pulling a fast one on us? Could she have killed him with another gun and then dropped this one near the body? In that case, what did she do with the gun she used? Well, got rid of it. Hit it. Destroyed it somehow. Oh, well, that's not easy. And she didn't have much time. We know Beasley left the hotel at 2.30 Sunday afternoon to go see Alexandra. And it takes at least 15 minutes to get there. So it's now 2.45. Huh? At 3 o'clock, Alexandra calls me to say she's killed him. I'm there by 10 after 3. So in 25 minutes... She has to kill Beasley and get rid of the gun, assuming your theory is correct. Well, 25 minutes can be a long time. If the gun is hidden, we can find it. Well, suppose she destroyed it. You're not talking about a piece of paper that can be shredded or burned. It's a fair-sized piece of heavy steel. Well, there's got to be an explanation. I have to have something for the inquest. <laughs> Alexander, do you want to help me out of an awkward situation? Certainly. Well, I have this problem. And it's really because of you. Me? You phoned me Sunday afternoon, told me you'd killed a fellow. I arrive here and I see this Beasley lying dead on the floor. Yes. I ask, why did you kill him? You answer, self-defense. Well, it's true. I ask, what did you kill him with? You answer, the gun lying there next to the body. Yes, I dropped it. No, no. I threw it to the ground immediately, like some some unclean, defiled thing. Well, then, here's my problem. Alexandra, you didn't fire that gun. Oh, but I... Nobody has fired that gun in years. It's doubtful if it can even be fired at all. Who killed Beasley? I did. Where is the gun you used? Well, you took it from me the other day. That's not the gun. Please, Alex, tell me. I'll have to search the house, the grounds. Why don't you save me the trouble? Is it possible someone else killed him? Well, I... how could someone else have killed him? You tell me. All right. 
This could be a fantastic explanation. But it's no more far-fetched than a gun. Suppose someone else had a motive. And that someone else followed him here. He or she could have watched the two of you through the French doors on the patio. He or she could have seen you become angry, reach for the antique revolver, point it at Beasley, and at that moment could have fired at Beasley, who then fell down dead. In the excitement, you actually might have thought that you fired the shot. Who... who would believe that? Think. Please, think, Alex. It's an old gun. It's heavy. It fires a very explosive charge. You would have felt it. You would have felt a shock in your hand and a tingling in your arm. Do you remember that kind of reaction? I... Oh, please, don't ask me any more questions. But I have to. Please, Harry. I'm sorry, but it's it's my job to... Harry. You haven't called me Harry since we were in high school. Oh. I used to feel so... So great that... But you even noticed me. Who was I? Well, you were, you were a very nice young man. Well, I'm still nice. Alexandra, you can trust me. I know you didn't kill Beasley. But I... I did. No, not with that gun, that antiquated forty-four. Someone else did. And you know who it is. Trust me, Alex. You know... You know you can trust me. You ought to trust me. That's why you called me Harry. Please, don't ask me. I have to ask you. Well, all right. I'll tell you who killed Martin Beasley. It was my Aunt Emma. Your Aunt Emma? Yes, my great Aunt Emma, Emma Edison. Emma Edison? The one whose picture's up there on the wall? Yes. Emma Edison? Well, she's been dead, she... She died before we were even born. You don't mean her. Yes, I do. She killed Martin Beasley. But that's impossible. Oh, Harry, you promised me I could trust you. And now you refuse to believe me. I'm sorry, Alex. Just go ahead and tell me. How did your dead Aunt Emma kill Martin Beasley? He's going to tell us, but not until the third act, which is always the classic place for such revelations. And now we have a new character to contend with, great Aunt Emma. If, as her grandniece contends, she was able to commit a murder after she was dead, what must this formidable woman have been like while she was still alive? I shall return with the answer shortly. they say, tell no tales. But of course, that may depend on your point of view. Dead men and dead women can be endowed with all sorts of powers, if only we were equipped to recognize them. We're about to make the acquaintance of a dead lady named Emma Edison. How could your great aunt Emma have killed Martin Beasley? I, well, it's so hard to explain. Please, Alex, try. Well, it... It, it hasn't been easy for me these past years. I know. No. No, I, I don't think anyone knows. It all has to do somehow with money. I, I don't know anything about money. Oh, money was always a piece of paper. The, the mail would bring me a piece of paper that said, now I had twice as much money as I did before. I, and then another piece of paper would come to inform me that now I had three times as much money pieces of paper. That's all they ever were to me. I- is it clear to you what I'm saying, Harry? Yes, it's clear, Alex. Your great Aunt Emma? Martin Beasley would come to see me, and he would insist that I turn it all over to the developers, that we increase the value of the land. He, he kept saying he would protect his interests and even mine. He tried to convince me that I would soon lose everything. And he threatened you? He told me they could have me declared incompetent. I I was terrified. 
One day, I looked at the portrait of great Aunt Emma above the mantel, and I said to it, you, you are so different, you would know what to do, and the most fantastic thing happened. There was a voice. You bet your sweet life I'd know what to do, little girlie. I, I couldn't believe it. I stared, and I just gaped at her, and I said, Who, who are you? Well, who do I look like? Well, you, you look like the great lady in the, in the portrait. You can't be talking to me. Why not? Well, this, <laughs> this is my imagination. Well, you're great Uncle Billy. He come out of the Union Army with a rubber bullet in his leg. The ragged clothes on his back and an old cap and ball, 44 revolver on his hip. He drifted north of the Rio, and he saw this land we're standing on now, and he took it. Took it? Yes, honey, took it. With the Colt 44, and it's our land. It's Edison land. Don't you ever forget it. But, but they want to take it from me. Who? Oh, that beastly varmint? I, I'm afraid. An Edison woman afraid? Huh. Look what's on the mantelpiece. I, I don't see anything. You think it's an antique. You think it's just a forgotten family heirloom. Well, it's Wild Billy's Cap and Ball 44. Now, the next time that Beasley Barman dares to set foot in here, you pick up the 44. Oh, no. And you say, I have the right to protect myself against intruders. Well, how, how could I say that? If he refuses to leave... Shoot him down. But you, you just can't shoot people down. Do you believe what I'm telling you, Harry? Cousin Beasley came back. It was more than a week ago, and his wife was with him, and I noticed that she looked at the gun. Yes? That's all. Cousin Beasley was telling me to do what he wanted, and she just kept looking at the gun. She asked me what caliber gun it was, and I said it was a forty-four. And what did she say? Nothing. And what happened? Nothing. He said he would give me till Sunday to think things over. And he came back on Sunday? Yes. At about a quarter to three, he was angry, abusive, and threatening. I was very frightened. And then I became aware of Aunt Emma standing beside me. You became aware of Aunt Emma standing beside you. Was Mr. Beasley also aware of her? No, because he just kept shouting at me. And Aunt Emma kept saying to me... Order him out. And I kept saying, I'm frightened. Pick up the 44. Go ahead. And I did. I said, get out. Shoot him. Shoot him. And I kept saying, I can't. I can't. And she, she... Yes? She took the pistol out of my hands, pointed it at Cousin Beasley, and she fired. I... I closed my eyes. I may have blacked out for a moment. When I opened my eyes, Emma was gone. And my cousin Beasley was lying on the floor. He was dead. The pistol was lying there next to him. I see. Do you really see, Harry? Yes. But why did you insist then that you killed him? Because if I had told anyone else what really happened, they would have said I was crazy. That they, they would take my land away. Please, don't tell that story to anyone else. But... It's true. <sighs> that that might make it even worse. Hello, Martha. Oh, you look like a person with a problem. Oh, Sheriff, I can't get enough help to clean the rooms properly. I uh, see Mrs. Beasley is in the dining room, along with Mr. Hawkins. Uh, they just sat down to eat. Which means they'll be here at least an hour. Uh, more likely 20 minutes. They're not folks who know how to relax over food. Uh, even 20 minutes should be enough. For what? For me to search her room. Oh. Any objections? Oh, no. No, none at all. What are you looking for? A gun. A gun? Yeah. 
Are you saying she killed her own husband? Well, according to what you told me, she'd have liked to have killed him. Yeah, but <laughs> twixt the wish and the deed, there's... <laughs> there, there's a gun. Go through those drawers, and I'll look through the closets. There's not a sign of a gun of any kind. Uh, I guess it isn't here. Hey, well, what, what are you looking in the wastebasket for? Well, you never know. Oh, she certainly wouldn't have thrown a gun into the wastebasket, would she? No. But she did throw something else in here. What is it? You complain about how it's hard to get your maids to do a thorough job. Well, I certainly do. Miss Beasley? Mr. Hawkins? Mind if I join you? Oh, sit down, Sheriff. I think it's time we arrived at an understanding. I agree. What is holding things up here? What are you people trying to pull? When is that coroner going to hold his inquest? I believe he can hold it this afternoon. Well, why doesn't he? Yeah, he's hoping something might turn up. Something like what? Something definite. Otherwise, he'll have to have a verdict to the effect that Mr. Beasley's death was caused by a person or persons unknown. But Mr. Beasley was killed by Miss Edison. Who says so? She says so. Well, she may have been nervous, overwrought. But everybody knows she killed him with that antique pistol. If you contend that she killed him with that forty-four. Then we have the testimony of expert witness Sergeant Terry of the state police that the gun in question could not have been fired. Well, it doesn't matter. I don't care if she killed him or not. Her conduct is sufficient evidence that she is not competent. Which is really what you're after. You want Mrs. Beasley here to succeed to control of the estate. And I don't think there's too much you can do about it. If you're willing to grant that Miss Edison did not kill Mr. Beasley, then we open up a fascinating line of inquiry. Who did? And how? Now, that's not my problem. It does become your problem if the killer is Mrs. Beasley. What are you trying to imply? Now, don't say a word. Oh, good lawyer's instinct. Shut her up. How dare you make this abominable accusation? It's a speculation. Let us suppose that Mrs. Beasley follows her husband to the Edison house on Sunday, watches the activity through the patio door. Sheriff, I'll have you know. She sees a frightened, angry Alexandra threaten Beasley with that antique revolver. Mrs. Beasley here has another forty-four, which she fires through the open door. Of all the ridiculous... Poor, terrified Miss Edison actually believes she herself is the killer. You couldn't prove a word of this. All you have is speculation. Oh, I never said it was anything else. Then we don't have to listen to it. You don't have a shred of evidence. Well, I do have a shred of something. That's a piece of paper. A receipt from a hardware store in Calvin's Corners, which is some 20 miles from here. A receipt for the purchase of one box of 44 caliber cartridges. Why did you buy a box of 44 caliber cartridges, Mrs. Beasley? Jeanette, don't say a word. Oh, what's the use? They can prove I bought the shells. And why? I wanted to kill him, Jack. But I didn't. I had this absolutely rattlebrain, crazy idea. When I was at her house with him, I saw the gun. I figured if I could get a shell for it and kill him with it... It could be pinned on her. As your attorney, Jeanette, I warn you. But I didn't do it. I bought the bullets. I sneaked back there one day. I saw her out walking. I got into the house and I... I couldn't even load that stupid thing. It was an old-style gun. It couldn't take a modern-type cartridge. Whatever the reason, I hated him. He was such a... A jellyfish. It could also be assumed that the reason you bought the shells was because you had a forty-four caliber revolver of your own. And after you used it, you disposed of it somewhere. Oh, that isn't true. Sheriff, you couldn't prove that. I notice you no longer have that fine edge of certainty in your voice, Mr. Hawkins. Well, well, what are you going to do? Well, I can't withhold evidence. But I won't push. If both of you agree... Not to bother Miss Edison anymore. But all you're doing is making the thing more complicated than ever. I'm sorry, Doc. Uh, if Alexandra killed him, how could she have fired the gun? If Mrs. Beasley killed him, where's the gun she used? And there still may be one more possibility. 
There could be someone who ain't telling all he knows. Who? You. Me? What more could I possibly know? Uh, you head over here's in love with her, and maybe now there's a chance for you. So you decided to save her. How could I do that? There was another gun, a gun that worked. She killed him with it. You were first on the scene, so you put that gun in your pocket, and you threw that old antique pistol on the floor. You can't believe that, Doc. Oh, I could. But I could never prove it. I got maybe a half a ton of suspicions, but I don't have one single ounce of proof. Nor am I likely to find any. So, as coroner, what's going to happen, Doc? <laughs> You're probably going to get married to Alexandra Edison. I mean, what's going to happen as far as the murder of Martin K. Beasley is concerned? I don't know. Maybe nothing will ever happen. After all, not every murder that's committed gets solved, does it? No, it certainly doesn't. And if you like everything nicely rounded off and tied up in a neat little package, we cannot deliver it this time. But that's how life works out most often, doesn't it? As the poet said, the road to resolution is paved with doubt, and the more you question, the less you find out. Our problem is... We may have found out too much. We shall discuss this further shortly. It has been said that nothing changes more constantly than the past. For the past that influences our lives may not consist of what actually happened, but of what we believe did happen. The very split second an act is committed, it belongs to the past. And it begins to be molded and refined and, most likely, rewritten. Who killed Martin K. Beasley? It depends on your point of view. And your point of view is the infinite number of ideas, fears, desires, and whatnot that are constantly churning around in your psyche. And in mine... Our cast included John Beale, Court Benson, Carol Titel, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.